some years ago in the Genesis Synod, which is the national gathering of the Anglican Church of Canada, with representatives across the country, both clergy and laity, there was a great debate which raged back and forth. And people waxed eloquent throughout this debate and had a lot to say, which, of course, Anglican always do. Until the now late Reverend Harry Robinson stood up to speak. And um, his final comment was it all depends on your hermeneutic. And no one knew quite how to respond to that. I mean, he is Anglican, it's all known what hermeneutic means, right? Mm -hmm. It's part of our, it's one of those, you know, theological terms. And it's a long word, but we carry it around and cherish it. I think we cherish it so much we don't like to use it. I think that's the main thing. So Harry used this word, it all depends on your hermeneutic, and no one knew how to respond at the end of the debate. It's interesting, the words that we understand easily, the concrete words, are the short three, four, or five other words. They're the old, old English words. I get up, I wash, I eat, I go for a run, walk, swim, a bike ride, I go to work, I talk, I read, I learn. And I said all that with three, four, or five other words. So that's no, there's no ambiguity. There's no ambiguity in each of those words. We know what it means when we say I walk or I run or I eat or I see. We understand them. There's no question of them. And usually those words are concrete. I mean, some people use these words. I was talking to a member of our family the other day uh, who's a nurse who told me that uh, I said, you know, like you have orthology and neurology and gastroenterology and a whole lot of things. Why do the words need to be so long? She said, well, actually, uh, when we use them, we just say ortho and neuro and um, so on. I mean, you could get anything even short. You know, you could talk about heart, brain, gut, and leave it at that. But it's nice to have longer Latin words to explain what we're doing. But then we come to some words, and I wanted to talk today about faith. We heard about faith in our reading from the letter of uh, it's not Paul's letter, the letter to the Hebrews. We don't know who wrote it, maybe a fellow, we're not sure, of the person of the gender who wrote the book of the letter to the Hebrews. So the letter to the Hebrews in chapter 11 has to do with faith. And that letter says a lot about faith. Now faith is uh, one of a few of our religious words that we don't have such an easy time describing. Remember a few weeks ago we read from 1 Corinthians 13, and at the end of 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, and so many of these three, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. And I talked at that time, I don't remember what it was, sometime in the last seven months, I talked at that time about what love means. And we often think about love as a I mean, I love my wife, I love my children, chocolate. We talk about all the things that we love, and we mean something different about each of those things. But when I spoke to you about love that time ago, I mentioned love is not just a feeling. Love is a decision, an action. When Jesus said, love your neighbor, Jesus wasn't talking about feeling good about your neighbor. And it's interesting because the people that about whom you would say, I love so and so, there are feelings that we have which prompt us to do things for that person which is good for them. So to love someone, we get confused, rightfully so, about whether love is the feeling or the action. We do good things for people whom we have feelings for. Jesus said, to do good things for people that we don't necessarily have any feelings for, or, or, or perhaps we have feelings of disappointment, anger, annoyance, or whatever. And Jesus tells us to love that person. And the interesting thing there is that we do the action which prompts the feeling. We act in a loving manner, and then we begin to feel a loving attitude towards it. So we talk about it, and then 
faith, hope, and love. I'm working my way back to faith by the end. Hope, what is hope? I hope I remain the lottery, and I know that the law is 649. I have one chance in 14 million to win that ticket, buy a ticket. I also know that I have two chances in 14 million of being struck by lightning, and I don't even need to buy a ticket. Hope can be about very uncertain things like that. But hope can be, um, I was hoping this morning that we would actually get to talk to people online with live streaming and the hope proved to be true. I was 99.9% sure we could, and here we are. Hope sometimes is about something which is pretty certain. And I hope that we'll have dinner with friends on Wednesday night. That's a pretty certain thing, but the lot of you are pretty sketchy. Well, faith that we read about today, faith is to be sure of what we hope for, to be certain of the things we do not see, sure of what we hope for, certain of things we do not see. That's faith. As though the writer to the Hebrews, had this long chapter 11. We don't read a small portion today. We read about Abraham. But the writer also talks about Enoch, Enoch and Moses and Cain and uh, a bunch of others that I don't remember. All the ones just list one after another after another after another. So uh, the writer tells us that Abraham, by faith, went to another country because God told him to go to another country. Had he seen the country? Didn't know what it was like, but God said go, so he had faith to go. God also told him that he would have a child in his old age. And the writer says, when he as good as dead, yeah, he was 99 years old and was like the baby, long past the age for childbearing, and yet he believed God. He had faith that that would come true. One of the ones that's listed later in, in the chapter that I find always chuckle when I read it. God's talking to Moses out of the burning bush. You know that story of the burning bush? Moses is there. And God's telling Moses to go to Egypt and deliver the people of Egypt out of slavery. And God says to Moses, This is how you know that I said, Here's the sign. When you deliver the people and get back, you will worship God on this mountain. Personally, I like the sign first, but I'm happy with that. But therefore, I start to promise that the, the proof of his promise was an after the fact event. And that's really what faith is about. Faith is taking a step when we don't know the result. So we have faith, the sun will come up tomorrow morning. We've got a lot of evidence to indicate that. The toddler has faith that the parent will catch the toddler when thrown in the air and they laugh and giggle. They have faith in that from previous experience. Maybe the first time they were scared, but after that, they got to like it. Most kids, I think. Maybe some don't. So we have faith. Not about certain things. But we have faith in certain people. So to have faith about heaven is to have faith in God. In our reading today from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 1, we read how God said, Let that happen, your new moons and your sadness and your endless tramping on our court. I don't need the blood of wolves and goats, and yet. Wait a minute. That's exactly what God had told the people of Israel to do through Moses. Here's the list of all the things you need to do and what dates have to do. New moons and Sabbaths and sacrifices here and sacrifices there. And that's what they were doing. But the problem was that they were doing without faith. They did not have faith in God. They had faith in their own ability to make a transaction with God. I sin. I pay the price. I don't Good to go. And that's what was going on. They trampled the pool. 
They did not care for the community. And so Isaiah, speaking on God's behalf, brought the strong word of the Lord against them. With, at the end of the chapter, a promise of redemption that they would turn in their hearts. Jesus, in our passage today, talked with his disciples about storing up treasure in heaven. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Sell what you have, give to the poor. Do good works, do good things. Be always ready, always waiting. When you're in that state of mind, when you live expectantly for God, trusting in God, hoping for God, hoping in the thing that you don't see, then you have faith. Faith is a gift, a gift that God gives to us. May God grant each one of us a faith that can move mountains. A faith that holds us secure in the hands of God until the time when we see Christ face to face. In the place where our heart already is, store everything.